Almost everything we do today, from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, depends on constant access to a form of energy that our ancestors could only dream about. From the appliances that wake us up and fix our coffee, to the spark plugs and electronics in the cars we drive to work, to our computers and cell phones and more, electricity powers nearly every facet of our lives. Yet not so much more than a century ago, it was the stuff of pure fantasy, like the electric submarine Nautilus in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Practical electric power was unthinkable before the Industrial Revolution. It remained barely thinkable for most of it. Only in the early 1900s did widespread electricity direct to the home become possible, even though scientists from Aristotle to Ben Franklin had observed electric phenomena, and primitive generators and batteries had been around for a century by then. But when the moment came, it came fast. In the 20 years from 1908 to 1928, electricity went from experimental to universal as its real price dropped almost 90%. The telephone and then the radio became commonplace. Factories converted from steam power to electric and moved and worked on parts from end to end of long assembly lines powered by electricity. The time to manufacture a Model T car fell from 12 hours to less than two, and its price from $1,000 to 250 Electricity made new types of smelting possible, and new metals like aluminum and titanium came into use. Millions of households hooked up to the spreading power grid. Much of the dirt, soot, and smoke of the coal-fired existence vanished, replaced by the quiet, clean hum of electrical machines and appliances. Lifestyles changed, and they've never been the same since. What powered this surge of electrification so many decades after the first generators and batteries? It might be more accurate to ask, why didn't it happen before? The ingenuity wasn't lacking. Some of the greatest minds of the 19th century, like Michael Faraday, worked on electricity. Nor was it the danger of a fatal shock at the time, no likelier than a boiler explosion or an oil fire. No, what had been keeping electricity rare was the scarcity and expense of the one metal most needed for it, copper. Since the earliest experiments with electricity, inventors had zeroed in on copper as the best conductor. No metal other than silver did such a good job of getting electrons to flow from point A to point B constantly, evenly, and without any fuss. And while copper was not exactly cheap, it was cheaper than silver. In the middle to late 1800s, most copper came from complexes of mines in Michigan, Mexico, Australia, and the Andes, later from southern Africa and Montana. In aggregate, these produced a few tens of thousands of tons of copper each year. But this was the accumulated total production of many thousands of mines, most of which produced perhaps a ton per day from networks of tunnels that resembled a human-sized ant colony and were just about as high-tech. Only the largest of the underground operations had machinery like pneumatic drills and steam engines. At most of them, the fanciest mining equipment around would have been instantly recognizable to any miner of the preceding two centuries. As mining was slow and laborious, production was low and costs were high. In a depression toward the end of the 1800s, the price of copper dipped to the equivalent of about $6 a pound today, but for all but a few years that century, it cost double to quadruple that. Accounting for differences in income and GDP then, it was more like the equivalent of $25 or $30 a pound today. Nobody was going to be making lots of electricity or moving it anywhere at that price or, usually, higher. And volatility made it even worse. The copper price was so prone to violent swings that a commentator dubbed it one of the greatest gambling counters of Wall Street. 
It had a habit of unpredictably doubling and halving multiple times per decade. Partly, this was because tiny mines operating on a shoestring had no idea how much copper they could produce a week ahead of time, much less a year. No one could forecast production. But even more volatility came from a series of 19th to early 20th century shenanigans that included a nationalistic British copper smelting oligopoly, followed by a price-fixing French syndicate, topped off with an attempted market corner by a copper mining subsidiary of U.S. Standard Oil. Unfortunately, the British oligopoly was done in by the emigration of skilled workers bearing trade secrets. The French syndicate collapsed because the bankers who financed it didn't actually own the mines whose production they were trying to limit. And the American market corner fizzled because the geniuses at Standard Oil had forgotten that competition existed in the copper business. After several rounds of alternate price setting and underselling attempts left their amalgamated copper subsidiary hemorrhaging money, it dissolved. The Anaconda Copper Corporation swallowed its remnants, and the episode went down in history as one of the few times that market forces hoisted John D. Rockefeller's company on its own petard without any help from the government. Despite providing economic history with these and other shining examples of copper-plated stupidity, such machinations kept the price of electricity's key ingredient far too high to wire up any place larger than a neighborhood, and far too volatile to be relied upon for a multi-year electrification project. Even as the likes of Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, and Nikola Tesla made electrical transmission technically practical, towns and cities kept lighting with gas and hauling streetcars around by horse. Rural areas relied on kerosene lamps. There was no question of a regional, let alone national, grid. Such a thing would require more than a million tons of copper to be mined per year. Electrification was unaffordable, and it would be until more copper became available at a cheaper and steady price. Economists of the time warned that could never happen. Early 20th century monographs with titles like The Coming Copper Famine warned that mines could continue producing copper for only a few years more. Already, the tunnels and shafts were pushing as deep as they could. In Butte, Montana, the world's largest copper mines were drilling 3,000 feet below the Earth's surface. Companies had taken to lowering barrels of ice down shafts and installing cold air blowers to preserve life in the miners who toiled for hours in 110-degree heat with still hotter water seeping from the rocks around them. Accidents killed one miner every two days. These mines, plus their counterparts around the world, produced in total a few hundred thousand tons of copper each year, but even this could not last. They had already dug through and mined out the richest parts of copper deposits, where copper made up 10 or 20 percent of the rock, and the tunnels were moving into ores of only 8 to 10 percent copper. Far from having enough to bring electricity around the world, the copper supply was about to dwindle and its price was expected to rise accordingly. Everyone expected the cutthroat capitalists of the copper world to take more than full advantage of the looming scarcity to hike prices into the stratosphere. One English critic bitterly wrote that, only one thing can prevent a holdup of the entire world by the American copper magnates, and that is the discovery of fresh sources of supply. Such statements reckoned without one other factor, a man named Daniel Jackling. Born in Missouri in 1869 and orphaned at age two, Jackling spent his childhood shuttling around foster homes, most of which treated him as a free farmhand. He graduated high school several years behind schedule, but determined to obtain an education that would enable him to trade farm work for engineering. He finished a bachelor's degree in metallurgical engineering in 1893 and headed out west to seek his fortune. 
Jack Lang arrived in a Colorado gold mining camp with $3 to his name, having walked 18 miles from the train station since he couldn't afford a stagecoach ticket. He was quickly hired as an extractive metallurgist, finding ways to get the gold out of the ores more efficiently. His career progress was rapid. Two more years found the then 29-year-old in charge of designing and building a new gold extraction plant in Utah. Jackling decided to take a double risk on new technology. He abandoned the old and proven, but poisonous and environmentally catastrophic, mercury amalgamation method for refining gold, substituting a new extraction method instead. And perhaps even more consequentially, instead of having a series of coal-fired steam engines and lots and lots of hired workers run the plant, he splurged on all electric machinery and went for a fully mechanized operation. Though highly expensive, the innovative plant was a success. It made Jackling's employer one of the wealthiest men in America, and it made Jackling himself ambitious for more. In 1899, he was dispatched, along with one Robert Gemmel, to evaluate a gold prospect outside of Salt Lake City at a place called Bingham Canyon. The gold deposit that had been reported turned out to be underwhelming, but the rocks nearby contained 1 or 2 percent copper over an area of more than a mile. The deposit was a type called a porphyry, with a huge center of igneous rock surrounded by limestone and other sedimentary rocks. The whole thing had been altered by copper-bearing waters millions of years before, and all the rocks, both the porphyry ones in the igneous and the scarns in the sedimentary part, carried copper ore. It would make a gigantic copper mine, if it could be made a mine. Nobody except Jackling and Gemmel thought it could. In those days, mines were underground, and underground mining was plainly too expensive a process to make money off the 1 or 2 percent copper at Bingham. Instead of hiring thousands of miners and digging shafts, the mine would have to be dug as a giant pit starting right at the surface, with dynamite blasting rock, steam shovels loading it, and locomotives hauling it in railroad cars, all at rates of thousands of tons per day. Such a high volume of production, Jackling and Gemmel proposed, would make up for the lower amount of copper in the rock mined. But for this kind of mine, they would need $3 million, the equivalent of nearly $36 million today, up front. And it would take several years of work to build all that infrastructure before mining, and thus money-making, could start. This investment might have been considered worthwhile on a known mine with a demonstrated profit margin and an average of 10% copper. To plow it into an untried method operating on a never-before-mined type of deposit with less than a quarter of the usual minimum of viable copper concentration, in a volatile era when people got into the copper markets after they got bored playing Russian roulette, didn't just look like a risky investment strategy. It looked like the 1900 version of day trading cryptocurrency while drunk. Jackling's boss shelved the idea, and investors ranging from the Guggenheims to Edison's Electric Company refused to even consider it. The professional engineers at the Engineering and Mining Journal never evaluated Jackling and Gemmel's proposals by name, but summarized their views on the general concept. It would be impossible to mine and treat ores carrying 2% or less of copper at a profit. There appears to be no doubt as to the worthlessness of the proposition. Gemmel gave up in disappointment, but Jackling persisted. In 1903, three Colorado mine financiers reluctantly agreed to invest enough for a small-scale version of the mechanized pit mine that he had envisioned. Jackling hired skilled miners and started underground in the best parts of the deposit. 
At his instructions, the miners high graded relentlessly, providing enough cash flow to keep the investors from backing out, while Jackling developed his detailed plans for a bigger and better mine. The timing was fortunate. As Jackling was high grading enough to persuade his investors that he wasn't crazy, copper markets were rising again. The gap between high demand and low supply was rising. In 1905, it had started to yawn. Fears of a shortage hit their maximum. Prices rose, and the Guggenheim family suddenly decided that Bingham Canyon was a worthwhile investment after all. They stumped up nearly $8 million for the operation. Three years later, Jackling had eight steam shovels dumping blasted ore into railroads that moved around the mine wherever the active face was, carrying ore to the largest concentrator and smelter on Earth. And his new open-pit mining method was more profitable mining 2% copper than the old underground mines were at four or five times that. Jackling's idea spread beyond Utah. Both Arizona and Chile had the same type of giant but low copper concentration porphyry deposit as Bingham Canyon in spades. Soon, open pits were operating there, too. The smaller underground mines of earlier years, with their lower production and higher costs, started to drop off. Most of them would close within two or three decades after the open pits began. Each open pit could produce tens of thousands of tons of copper every year, at lower cost, by mechanically mining huge amounts of rock. Almost as important, they could predict about how much copper they would mine months to years in advance. The price of copper dropped by more than a third and stabilized. Apart from a brief spike during World War I, it would stay low, lower than ever before, low enough to open up electricity to everyone. In the years to 1930, the share of American households with access to electric power rose from 10% to almost 70%. America alone was producing about a million tons of copper metal each year. More than half of it now came from only 7% of the mines, the open pits in Arizona and Utah. The growth of copper and electricity continued in tandem over the 20th century, as more and more devices took advantage of the new availability of power. Machinery, once run by hand or horse, became electric. Machinery that had never existed, like the computer, came into being and then spread, following the paths of copper wiring and electric power. Electricity, unthinkable even in the middle of the 19th century, became ubiquitous and vital. Today, it runs the technology and equipment of our daily lives, the machines that vastly expand what we can do and shrink the time it takes to do it. Not so long ago, economists dismissed the possibility of most people ever being able to have electricity. They thought it was impossible to mine the million tons of copper per year that would be needed for it. At the time, they were right. The thousands of small but rich copper deposits mined underground with traditional methods would never have provided enough. But bulk mining in today's open pits now yields 21 million tons every year, providing more and more of the world with access to electric power and to the lifestyle that comes with it. And newer technologies, particularly green forms of energy and battery vehicles, are far more copper intensive than their last century counterparts. As they spread, as copper and other metals start to do the job of coal and gas and oil, the world will need more of them. Copper mining revolutionized the technological world a century ago, and today it's on course to do it again.